Well, it is 10 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started today. want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, another reminder to turn off your videos as, you, as uh, that helps save bandwidth for the program. Uh, if you have any questions, we have horticulturists who are here to help answer questions in the chat. So feel free to drop those questions in. Uh, Stephen will pause at different points to answer, or excuse me, yeah, to answer questions. And uh, those of us who are helping can also uh, answer some by chat as we go along. So uh, feel free to do that. If you, if even if you're not asking a question, I would encourage you to. Uh, watch the chat because occasionally we will post links to information that I think you'll find useful related to the program. Uh, we are uh, nearing the end. In fact, we are at the end of our Gardening on the Gulf series for this year. This will be our last presentation today. Uh, we're going out with a bang. Uh, Stephen Brugerhoff, who is horticulture agent in Brazoria County, is going to be talking about myths and uh, I'll, I'll just let him fully explain his topic as he comes on, but gardening myths is, is really popular. You know, the more you learn about horticulture, the more you cringe when you go online or go on Pinterest and read the latest myth uh, that uh, somebody is promoting because they read it somewhere. Uh, the Internet's a wonderful thing, but it's kind of like talking to your neighbor across the fence. It's only as helpful as your neighbor's knowledge level, and sometimes people's confidence in their information does not always correlate with the accuracy of their information. So Stephen's going to help us weed through all of that today. Uh, it's great to have him. I just want to mention, since we are taking a break now for uh, the Christmas holidays, uh, we'll be back on January 6th. I'll be doing a program on growing transplants. So if you're wanting to start transplants for the spring garden, uh, next year we're going to be going to an every other week format. So from January 6th, our next presentation will be on January 20th. Paul Winsky, horticulturist in uh, Harris County, will be talking about house plant maintenance and identification. And we have a lot of other things being planned for next year. So you want to stay tuned and share this with your friends. Uh, just one reminder up front, we'll try to remember to do this at the end. These programs are recorded and they are available on a website, which I'll post in chat as we go through this today. Uh, so if you want to go back and watch past programs, or if you want to rewatch today's program, or if you want to share them with your friends, you can do that uh, by using the YouTube channel we'll post that has the recordings. So without any further ado, Stephen, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, I am excited about learning about horticultural myths today uh, and uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. All right. Thank you very much, Skip, uh, for the introduction. I really appreciate it. And thank you to our colleagues who are uh, assisting with supporting any questions that you might have. Again, as Skip said, go ahead and put them in the chat box. We'll be able to get to them as we uh, go along through the program. I'll try to um, have enough snap to uh, stop myself for a few moments and, and answer any questions that you might have. Again, this is all live. Um, so we're really happy to be bringing these programs to you. Um, I guess, yeah, let's get started. Uh, horticulture myths and mystics. We're going to help to understand uh, what we're doing as far as providing uh, accurate information to you and helping to dispel a few gardening myth information that's currently out there. Uh, this is just a brief overview. Uh, I've marketed a little bit about the program ahead of this program. So we'll be discussing some myths that uh, you may have, you may currently be practicing uh, or have heard about. Uh, pine needle mulch lower soil pH. I'm sure we've all heard that. Epsom salt secure blossom and rot. Uh, too much compost is a good thing. Can't get enough compost. Well, you might rethink that in a moment with some information that I've got for you. Uh, how do you keep your clippers clean? How do you keep from spreading pathogens to those other plants and affecting, affecting those plants that you're helping uh, in your garden? Uh, native plants are always best. Well, it depends. We'll see all that in a moment. Tomatoes need a pollinizer. I'll explain what a pollinizer is. It may be a new term for you. Some old timers may know what that means. Tree topping is beneficial to growth. Let, we'll be putting that into context of what we mean by tree topping and uh, the appropriate practice for that kind of action. Uh, wood chip mulch robs soil nitrogen. I'm sure you've all heard that before. 
How many of you think that putting sand on the problem is going to help it? If you've got drainage problems in your yard, adding more sand to it is going to uh, uh, address that. Well, we've got some information that may, may help redress that with you. And then, of course, uh, containers and how we treat uh, the media, how we treat that container itself. Oftentimes, I've had folks that will say, you know, adding some rocks to the bottom of, of the pocket or ro rocks in the bottom of the container will help. And that is not always the case, but we'll address that in, the, in a moment. These programs are brought to you, of course, by Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. We offer practical how-to education programs that are based on university research to help your quality of life. And we do that through branded programs like the EarthKind uh, program, uh, EarthKind Landscaping. It offers uh, easy to understand information. We've break, broken it down for you to help you be more sustainable in your gardening practices, but appropriate uh, practices that'll help to grow the skills that you already have. Now, um, we were funding behind the scenes when we were building up towards this program. How many of you remember, um, uh, I grew up at an age when television was was king and queen of, of uh, my world. And of course, my parents would watch the, uh, the Johnny Carson show and he had this one gag or this one bit um, where he pretended to be a mystic and would try to predict, you know, in a funny way, things that would, would occur in our in our normal lives. It was something that we could all relate to. We were funny behind the scenes saying, well, Stephen, what if you took a, a seed packet and then, you know, made a prediction with that? Well, let's go ahead and do that, right? A little bit of fun at the end of the year. I've got a seed packet. What kind of methods should we be using when we're investigating a problem? How do we diagnose uh, uh, issues? Well, let's see what the old seed packet has to say. Ah, I see. We need to apply critical thinking skills to any kind of action that we take. Apply critical thinking skills to what, what, uh, to any kind of gardening methods that you're using, or that you hope to use in the future. It'll help to rub off on. Um, it'll cert certainly make an improvement in, in the garden and the landscape that you have, as well as rub off on those neighbors that you're trying to impress. So, critical thinking skills is an analysis of facts to help form a conclusion, and we're using the scientific method to do that. For us, uh, I am. Um, I'm an armchair researcher, if you will. I do have research projects at a demonstration garden that we have here in uh, Angleton at, a, a, at, the, at the Brazoria Environmental Education Station, a little demonstration garden. We affectionately call it bees, me and my master gardeners. And we do use the scientific method in, in the uh, research that we have on site. So we have a tomato uh, research plot. Uh, currently, we're trying to identify which tomatoes do well in our local environment. So I get information of recommendations for tomatoes that may work in, um, in uh, this uh, region or in our county, but I want, to, I want the proof in the pudding. I want to have an observational uh, research model that would um, help to, me to understand which varieties I actually do work. You know, so I, I want to commit that, that scientific method to understand which tomatoes that I can then confidently uh, tell our county residents will work in, in their home landscape. So the scientific method is made up of observations, questions that we that are brought up in part of these observations, making a prediction or a hypothesis based on that factual information. Of course, experimentation is all part of that, and then we draw a conclusion from that. I encourage you to use critical thinking uh, skills in every practice that you have. Now, uh, researchers, scientists go through the same method. Uh, there are papers there. Uh, we call them um, primary research. There are journals. Uh, there are scientists that do publish in journals that uh, will uh, provide very technical information uh, to you. And, you know, of course, I encourage you to try to seek out some of those scientific journals just to, you know, uh, look at the scientific method, but uh, we're uh, out by myself, and my fellow Aggie uh, horticulture agents are helping to disseminate or break down that information that makes it more applicable and easier to digest for the home gardener and for, for ourselves, for you and I. So let's address myth number one, pine needle mulch acidifies 
soil. So you may already know that, you know, depending on where you live in our in district, what we call District 9 or along the Gulf Coast, maybe you're closer down to Corpus Christi and you're viewing this program. Uh, you're up closer to in Montgomery County, up, up in Conroe, where the, uh, where, what is it, they call that, the Pine Curtain actually starts, where um, the soil type uh, can, um, the soil type and the uh, plants that grow there, uh, they, they've uh, evolved over time to uh, function in that environment. Uh, and so we know that pines uh, do well in sandy soils, that they, uh, you know, do better in a more acidic environment, that the pine needles themselves are acidic. And so we, you know, we'll, we'll take that information and extrapolate it and say, well, you know, it must help my blueberries. If I want to grow blueberries down here in Angleton, um, you know, you, you've really got to put a, sink a lot of resources in, into the, into the uh, media, into the growing environment that you're trying to, to raise those. You can do it, um, but I'd recommend to do it to um, garden uh, for blueberries or to raise blueberries in containers so that you can modify that local environment. And I have had uh, individuals say, well, you know, if I put pine needles on top of that as a mulch, it's going to acidify the soil. Well, that's not, uh, we can't really make that correlation. The facts are, even though the pine needles uh, have a lower pH, have been measured with a low, much lower pH, they wet once they're placed on top of the soil. There's a, a natural process that occurs. They're degraded by microbial activity through the decomposition process, and that pH does not translate to the soil. It just does not get absorbed the way we, we would hope it does or think it does. So I, didn't, I do encourage you to use uh, pine needles as a mulch. It is, uh, if you can, you know, if you have uh, a uh, resource that is not detrimental to your local environment. I've got a couple of pine trees out in uh, the front yard in, in my house, and uh, I live around uh, the Clear Lake area around Houston, and I collect those pine needles, and I do use them as a mulch, but I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, expecting them to provide or acidify the soil. It just doesn't work that way, folks. So, if you do have access to them and it's appropriate, certainly use them as mulch, use, uh, use uh, wood chips uh, as a mulch. Um, we want, they do serve a purpose, uh, help to you know, ameliorate any kind of erosion that you might have and the soil provides a little bit of cover. You know, some can somewhat um, modify the uh, soil temperature at that interface, but again, they're not going to acidify your soil for you. Um, Let's talk about Epsom salt. Now, when I was online with our uh, my colleagues yesterday, I asked them, you know, I, I said, here's the, uh, here's the questions or the myths that I'm going to approach. Is there any additional information you'd like to, you'd like uh, me to address during my presentation? Um, but every one of these topics, these 10 topics that I'll be talking about, we all um, nodded our heads in agreement. These are, these generally will come up um, from gardeners that we interact with, uh, even from, uh, you know, from, from just the general public. So one uh, myth that I'd like to address is Epsom salt will help to cure blossom and rot. Now blossom and rot is, um, if you, uh, a blossom and rot is uh, more of a descriptive term for what happens to uh, a tomato. The tomato itself will start to collapse, the cell starts, starts to collapse. And it's thought that that's related to a calcium deficiency. Uh, Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate. I've got the, uh, I've got the, uh, um, the chemical, uh, chemical attribution to it, MgSO4. Um, and it's, it, it really is not going to assist with making calcium more available to those plants. So if we know the blossom end rot is related to calcium deficiency. And that calcium deficiency is related to water availability to that plant. So whether, whether uh, the plant is undergoing a, um, not enough water, uh, drought-like conditions, if it's not getting adequate water, if it's not on a consistent watering schedule, you're going to encounter problems within that plant. Part of that is the uh, 
this uptake of calcium through that process through through soil water. So uh, if we know that, we know that also we can deduce from there that Epsom salts are not going to be able to cure this issue. If we're going to apply magnesium sulfate, if you look at the product itself and understand what it is comprised of, what nutrients are available in those, in those particular elements or minerals, you'll understand how to apply it appropriately, right? So we know that magnesium sulfate is high in uh, available magnesium, and we want to apply that to deficient so to soils that have been identified with a deficiency in magnesium, right? Oftentimes you'll see that in intensively cropped lands. How do you know, how do you know if your soil is deficient in magnesium or any other element? Commit a soil test. Committing a soil test helps to identify those nutrient deficiencies. That and other characteristics that you'll see on the plant. If the plant itself has chlorosis, a yellowing of the leaves, you know something's up. You know something's wrong. There's there's potentially some sort of uh, nutrient deficiency, right? And so a soil test is going to be one part of that puzzle that helps you to collect data to make an accurate diagnosis and then a resolution or a solution to that problem. So Epsom salts, it's not a cure-all. Um, I would also like to point out that I mentioned intensively cropped lands. So on a larger context, if it's a commercial uh, production course, those farmers are keeping an eye on all of the elements or all of the natural resources that go into the end product, into that crop production. But I'd like to take it down to our level, to the homeowner level, right? If we're raising vegetables, that's going to be completely different than if we're landscaping with ornamental plants. So keep that in context, keep that in mind when we're um, thinking of addressing some of these issues. In this case, of course, we're talking about vegetable production, blossom and rot caused by a calcium deficiency, not by a magnesium deficiency. So Epsom salts is not going to assist, uh, assist you in this case. But if we're uh, working in a, in, with an, an ornamental landscape, you know, um, um, a garden out in our front yard, maybe it's curbside, maybe it's, um, you know, we've got a pollinator garden that's completely different than uh, continuing to manipulate the soil or the environment, localized environment on an annual basis. So always put this into context as well. In this case, we've addressed a specific issue, but I also uh, beg you to think about that context when we're talking about other myths and other issues upcoming. You can never apply too much compost. How many of you uh, come? Raise your hand if you if you if you compost at home, and uh, I hope you do. Uh, I think composting is a, a wonderful activity. It certainly um, has drawn my myself and my wife closer together, and uh, my family as well. When our kids were little. We had them uh, participate in this process. It was something that we could all do and then see the benefit of that. But we all know that too much of, too much of anything is, may not be such a good thing as well. So let's look at this really quickly. What about compost? Okay, my machine is not functioning. Sorry, folks. Um, oh, there we go. Let's look at the, the, the compost itself. Of course, we know that we can derive um, nutrients from compost. Y'all recognize those three numbers. If you look at, um, for my colleagues, I, I, I've never asked my colleagues this question, so I'll just kind of address my colleagues at this point in time. But I, when I look at um, products that are uh, fertilizer, there's some products that I'll see with these three primary numbers. And for the uh, viewer, we know that those three numbers are addressing the, micro, the uh, macronutrients available in that product. Uh, the first number, of course, is uh, the percentage of nitrogen in that product. The second number is phosphorus. And the third number is potassium, or sometimes referred to as potash. So those three numbers are very, very important to plant uh, health and vigor. Um, and typically, in general, this is just a general statement, mind you, 
Compost that we make at home or plant-based compost typically will have a 3-1-2 ratio, right? So 3% uh, 3 of that, um, you know, of that handful of compost that you have is going to have a, uh, uh, is going to have, is 3 percent of that is going to be nitrogen, 1 percent of that is going to be phosphorus, and the last percent, 2 percent, is going to be potassium. There's been an estimate that a manure-based compost I was joking with my colleagues yesterday, uh, the city of Houston, uh, not the city of Houston, but the Houston Zoological Gardens or the Houston Zoo, at one point, uh, point were giving away uh, zoo dew or elephant dung. And of course it was dried and, and uh, cured before it was released to the public, so it, it was safe. These are herbivores, right? We know that herbivores are, you know, just eat, uh, just eat, um, eat, eat uh, plants. But in general, manure-based compost is thought to have a one-one-one one ratio. So it's um, fairly concentrated in some of those elements that we would uh, anticipate to, you know, that benefit, uh, that we would get a benefit from, from a compost. So what that means is, is you really should be aware if you've got a higher percentage of phosphorus that you're applying to a soil that already has a um, an element that is not as readily available, uh, then it's always best not to add a lot of that product to your your gardening, your garden or your vegetable garden or your landscape garden. So I'd, I'd say in general, um, we want to uh, keep to no more than about an inch per year of compost and material that we're applying to our, our gardens. And again, really it depends on how, how often you're turning over that soil. If you're working with, working in a vegetable garden is going to be a little bit different, right? You're tilling that environment. You're, cost, you're constantly depleting those, um, you're gosh, increasing the depletion of certain nutrients through the activity that we're providing to that. We're turning the soil. Um, we're, uh, we need to, may need to add a little bit more of these particular, um, these particular elements to our, to the, to the local environment, but you may not be doing so in a, in an ornamental landscape. It's just a different way of thinking about it. So, you know, if you're going to, uh, attempt to apply a lot of compost to the problem that you may, start um, uh, having issues with accumulated salts as well. So manure-based compost typically will have uh, a little bit more accumulated salts in there, which is not going to be good for your uh, local environment. Um, less is more or moderation, moderation annually. So I do encourage you to put compost on your uh, local environment, on the, on the local environment, whether it's ornamental landscaping or vegetable gardening, but do it in moderation. Skip, are there any questions so far? Uh, I think we've kind of taken care of them in the chat. Um, th there was a question about pine bark being acidic, acidifying or not, because uh, you'd commented about the the um, needles themselves. Yes, I think the same uh, process goes with um, with pine bark mulch as well. Y'all may, I'm sure y'all already addressed this, but um, you know, we're still looking at a degradation process that that is going to somewhat negate that. It's it's a much longer time investment to start affecting um, soil pH. Um, so yeah, uh, it's it's it. We're still looking at a decomposition process that's going that's going to. Uh, that's the, I wouldn't say negate the process, but you know certainly it's going to slow it down considerably. All right. Just want to remind everybody you can ask questions in the chat, and uh, Stephen will be happy to answer you, or Ginger, or myself uh, will be answering questions online. All right. As far as clean air our tools. This is a real thing. There are pathogens that can be transferred from the tools that we're using to prune plants. When we're using these tools, we're, you know, we're, we are intruding on the, uh, 
on the uh, vascular tissue of those plants. You know, we're working with plants that have a vascular system. And of course, we're cutting into them using pruners. And, uh, you know, you do have the uh, potential for transferring them. Um, I, I would suggest that we should be more concerned with viruses or viroids um, or bacterial pathogens. Fungal pathogens, you know, they, they do have the potential to transfer from your tools, but it's really, I, I see that more as a seasonal, um, seasonal event. So I, I'd be more concerned uh, regarding uh, viruses and bacterial pathogens. And e each one of us has our own method for cleaning these tools. Alcohol, dipsa, in the, uh, in the laboratory uh, to sterilize tools, uh, I, I was present at a video uh, from the Texas Plant Disease Diagnostic Lab. Uh, Dr. Ong and his staff um, and Sheila McBride, um, they were showing us how they sterilize their tools and they flame their, the, uh, the knives that they use to cut into plant tissue to make sure that they're not uh, uh, spreading those pathogens. And so that's certainly that's one way. I'm not suggesting, dear viewer, that you do this at home. <laughs> But it is one method that is used for sterilization of, of those pruning shears. Now, typically for us, we'll use whatever is at hand. And, you know, chlorine or bleach certainly can be used to clean your pruning tools. Uh, household cleaners, you may know this, you may not know this, but those products that are disinfectants like uh, Listerine or Lysol or even Pine Saw, if you've got it uh, around the house, um, you know, and of course you use it appropriately. You don't want to use these kind of products that are volatile in an enclosed environment. You don't want to choke yourself out, you know, or deplete the oxygen in a, in a closet by, by working with these tools. Always work in a well-ventilated uh, area when you're doing, when you're um, cleaning your tools. Uh, there is also uh, another product, it's a crystalline form called trisodium phosphate. You may have seen it in one of the uh, home uh, home stores, home household stores uh, with the name TSP on it. Certainly that can be used as well. Um, one thing that I'd like you to consider is how corrosive are these products to your tools? We're working with metal, folks. And so bleach is very, very corrosive. It's highly corrosive. So if you're going to clean your tools, if you're using best practices, let's say you're managing your small, you have a small orchard, you've got a few citrus trees in your backyard, um, and you're trying, you're wanting to practice, you know, use the best practice and not use these pruning tools from one plant to another. Pruning on one plant with uh, one set of uh, hand pruners is quite all right. You know, as long as you're pruning below those affected areas, the, any kind of damage that you see on the on the branches or on the leaves. Uh, but you you do want to clean those between citrus trees. So one individual tree can prune to your heart's content on that, you know, within reason um, for that one individual. But when you're moving to another plant, you do want to clean those to those tools. There are a couple of pathogens that um, that are of concern uh, to our county as well as other counties as well, to Brazoria County as well as other counties. Two pathogens, one is called citrus greening and the other one is citrus canker. Uh, while uh, both disrupt the vascular tissue, we don't want to take a chance and transfer that from one plant to the other. I'm not saying that your plants have those pathogens, but you certainly don't want to take that chance. So go ahead and clean those pruners between those, those trees. Let's say you've got a neighbor that has, that uh, doesn't have the tools that you have. You're a proud owner of tools. You know, um, I would clean them before you let them out for the very same reason. It may not be citrus. It may be some other pathogen that is specific to a, an ornamental tree that, it, that your neighbor has. So just best practices, do clean your pruning tools, but do it wisely. Uh, disinfectants, household cleaners like list, like those brand name products like Listerine, Lysol, Pine Sol, etc. Typically, they can be less expensive. Um, my uh, mother-in-law used to be a, an 
a, 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 an uh, eye surgeon nurse. And so she had access to these tiny little alcohol wipes and alcohol is is perfectly fine to uh, use on your on your tools, but it's a little bit cumbersome and can be uh, expensive in the long run. So again, you know, I'd rely on something that's more practical that you may already have around the household. So bleach has its has its um, has its place, but I'd suggest to use something else other than bleach because it can really do a num uh, do a number on your um, on the metal of your pruning tools in the long run. Now, this is from my own uh, personal perspective and professional uh, perspective as well. Native plants are always the best landscape choice. Now we know what the benefits of native plants, the general benefits are. They, um, a general, uh, general statement would be they use less resources, they attract wildlife, and they represent the local region. So those are great benefits. I used to work for an organization in, in Central Texas, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. It's one of the few um, authentic uh, native, not, not authentic, but um, native plant uh, botanical gardens in North America. There may be one other, I think it's up around Pennsylvania, associated with Longview, or it might be separate from that. Regardless, when I was going to school, those were the only two places that I knew of that worked exclusively with native native plants. And so I, I did have the privilege of working there for a while, but I got to develop my own understanding and grow more as a horticulturist by learning about our local ecology and about the beauty and appropriate use of native plants. And I've never been, personally, I've never been a, um, uh, I've never excluded uh, non-native, but appropriate ornamental plants um, or, or plants to my palette or to my yard. So I would pose to you, it really depends. Every plant has its purpose in an appropriate place, right? The right plant in the right place. I would put it back onto you. Think about the specific site considerations that should help to dictate your plant selection. So it may be a non-native but non-invasive or non-aggressive plant that may be your best choice for your landscape. So never, you know, don't don't not consider, always consider um, the the wider world of plants that we have available to us. And I do encourage you to start incorporating native plants, but think about what the plant is before you just put it in your yard. Um, we all uh, want to help conserve our environment. We do that through what I call the, the sexy mega fauna, <laughs> right? So um, monarch butterflies. Monarch butterflies has a, a, a really good, um, uh, everyone understands what a butterfly is. We all want to help save the environment and we do so through certain key species that everyone under that I would as a general statement, I would say that the majority of folks that I've encountered intuitively know what that is. They've seen them come across their path. They want to help uh, the environment. That's just one way of doing that through that one key species. Um, but there are certain plants that um, that those that those insects can um, only metabolize in a you know in their larval state as a caterpillar. So there's quite a number of native um, native uh, milkweed species that will work. We can use as a host plant, but not every native milkweed species is going to work in your landscape. Right? It depends on where you're at. Also, I, I ask you to think about where you are at. We're trying to replicate um, a natural. We're trying to re replicate a nat natural ecosystem in a highly manipulated environment. What I'm saying is, you know, in your yard, you're trying to uh, to replicate nature, and of course we. I'm not going to discourage you from doing that, but just keep that in mind. You've got a you've got an environment that's highly been manipulated already, to develop your house, um, to um, make it look nice to the homeowners association as well. So you know, keep keeping keep uh, adding native plants to your landscape, but think about the plants that you're going to use. 
the pictures that I have on this slide, the one in the upper uh, upper right hand corner, that is goldenrod. That's one species of goldenrod. There are many species of goldenrod that exist out there. What do you know about goldenrod? If you think you're allergic to goldenrod, you're probably allergic to the ragweed that blooms around the same time and grows very, very close and in closer vicinity to goldenrod. You're not, I, I, I seriously doubt you're, you're allergic to goldenrod unless you have an allergist test that and you can prove that. So um, it may be an appropriate uh, plant in the right place in your yard. If you, have a, if you have an open space that has adequate exposure to the sun in more of a prairie you know, environment, an open lawn, if you carved out a little space, you'd be able to grow a goldenrod quite successfully. The plant on the lower right hand corner, um, that is buttonbush. It's a native plant that you'll usually see in riparian areas. That means it can, it can, it can it actually can, uh, you can raise that successfully in, in um, diverse soil types, you know, whether it's a drier landscape, certainly it can handle it in a saturated soil environment, um, but it gets to be a large shrub. It is a, a shrub that's appropriate for pollinators. Uh, it produces these wonderful uh, flowers on them, but they do need uh, adequate uh, access to well-draining moist soil. And if you don't have that, this plant may not um, may not successfully grow for you. So again, always put the right plant in the right place, and it depends on your site on your site uh, conditions. Now, how many of you have heard this before? The tomatoes need a pollinizer. Now, a pollinizer is uh, another plant, um, a different uh, a, a, dip, a plant within the same plant family that has. Uh, different genetics in the pollen that it that it you know that it emits or that it produces. Uh, tomatoes are self-fertile, right? So they are self-pollinating, but I want to point your attention to the picture in the upper right hand corner. Do you see that? I, I don't know if I can make my cursor go around this. I think I'm doing that right now. My little arrow over the uh, screen. If you can't see that, that's okay. Look at the open faced flower. There's a cone-like structure. If you've ever looked at a tomato flower up close, it provides this cone-like structure that expresses itself from these recumbent uh, petals, right? Th that structure is called the staminal cone. Staminal cone It's comprised of, I think about seven, five to seven um, uh, stamens that, that um, uh, inside of that cone-like structure, that one single strand or one single tongue-like structure is, and there are anthers inside of that, but they're porocidal anthers. So the, the pollen is produced inside of this structure. There is a very small opening at the very end of it. And pollination can occur from wind movement or primarily from insects through vibration. Colleagues will call this a buzz pollination. Buzz pollination, buzzing is more of a, the sound that you hear from bumblebee species or other bees or uh, other insects that will grasp that cone-like structure and just start vibrating their, their body uh, to, um, to, kind of, to shake loose that pollen. So, if you know that about this particular species, there are other plant families that will produce flowers that have porocidal anthers, and they don't, don't all look the same. Members of the blueberry family will have porocidal anthers in them. They look differently. So they need a specific activity to cut loose that pollen more effectively. Uh, there are, um, th there are uh, tiny, uh, if you're, if I, I've heard that um, there are some commercial growers that will use the uh, technique of, of vibrating those flowers to um, to encourage the the uh, pollen to drop from those those porocidal anthers a little bit more effectively. 
when I was working with kids, I, I, I like to think of it this way. We would have a, an activity with children where I would take a, a salt shaker and um, a large salt shaker and I'd cover up some of those openings in the top of the salt shaker. And then I would uh, try to relate this information to them. I'd say, think of it this way, porocidal anthers. This is exactly what's going on. If you have an, uh, an open container of salt, a, you know, a container of salt with a cover on it, with all of these holes in it, only so much salt is going to come out of that. If you start covering up those holes, you're lessening the amount of salt that comes out of that. You may have to shake that uh, salt shaker a little bit uh, harder to get it to cut loose. So that's one way for me to think about some things and try to break down this scientific information. Okay, we've all we've all heard about. You may have heard about crepe murder, of course. Tree topping should be used to limit growth. What you're seeing right now is a um, a technique called pollarding. Pollarding is used indiscriminately on crepe myrtles. Uh, in, in, in the trade, it's sometimes it's referred to as flat capping. I think that's another term that I've heard where you just indiscriminately cut off the head of the, uh, or the, um, the uh, primary growth of uh, trees. There, uh, I wouldn't say that it's an indiscriminate use, but there has been a practice of tree sap, of um, young trees or saplings being capped or being cut to try to encourage growth so that it is uh, it's, uh, more presentable to the buyer. If you look at a, 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 a little tree and you see it in full foliage, you're gonna buy that, but um, you may be purchasing a plant that has been topped, uh, a single liter uh, sapling that has been topped to encourage it to grow, to get you to buy it. So I'd always say, you know, um, with a little bit of information will help you make uh, proper purchases at the nurseries that you do go to. Um, of course, topping these trees does cause uh, multiple branching on them. Uh, crepe myrtles, of course, they are known to be able to compensate for that quite successfully and put on a show. But I, uh, like some of my colleagues as well, uh, discourage the use of this particular practice, especially with crepe myrtles. Uh, I think crepe myrtles themselves are just amazing and outstanding trees, amazing, outstanding plants in their natural form. So why not encourage that natural form instead of topping them, uh, as is the general practice? I still do see uh, landscape companies provide this practice. Um, I have, uh, I will not name them, but I have relatives that think you need to continue to do this practice. And it doesn't matter how much I tell them that they, they continue to do this. Uh, you can reduce the life, life uh, of a tree. You're causing a lot of stress to those trees. So apply these kind of methods with, um, if you're going to apply these kind of pruning uh, methods or practices, do so with forethought. Think about what you're doing to that tree and how it's going to react to the action that you're providing to it. And in general, I would say don't uh, use pollarding as a method uh, for nurturing and maintaining your, your uh, crepe myrtle trees. Um, the exception to this rule if you, if you would call it a rule, how about the exception to this practice would be in fruit production. You do want to uh, prune those, um, the new peach sapling that you get. You do want to head that back at least a third back of that main trunk that's coming up. We want to create an architecture or a structure for production, and that's the exception. You remember when I led off this presentation, I was talking about that, right? Always take into context why we're applying these techniques. So in general, it's a, ge it's a general rule of thumb in ornamental horticulture, don't just top those trees. You're going to affect their long-term health. That practice is used by, um, by maintenance companies along um, uh, electricity lines. Um, if there's no other choice, if they've got a tree that was improperly planted, right? So if you're putting a tree in the ground, make sure you always look up. You were always looking down, but make sure you look up to make sure that you're not planting it underneath an electric line or a telephone line, because you will have a company that will come back through at some point and top that tree for you. All right. I really like this uh, particular myth as well. Wood chip mulch robs soil nitrogen, and I've heard that. 
uh, from uh, individuals that I've uh, that I've come across, either uh, folks that call me up on the phone and we talk a little bit about gardening and landscaping, or even even my own family, quite honestly. And I have to explain to them what this process is. So let's make a distinction between these two uh, organisms, right? Mulch. Mulch is a term used for organic layers, typically that's laid on, that's on the soil surface. Compost. Compost is an amendment. It's some, it's a material with, that we can use as a mulch, but typically it's incorporated into the soil. So we know what the benefits of using mulch is. I, I'll use mulch as a verb rather than an object, right? It helps uh, to reduce weeding helps reduce herbicide application, can cool down the soils a little bit or, or um, keep them a little bit warm. Um, it does provide a benefit for water conservation and it helps to slow the addition of organic matter as it decomposes. Now, the facts are that, uh, that wood chips will not draw soil nitrogen unless it's incorporated, unless it's used like we used compost, unless it's tilled into the soil. So mulch uh, on the top, it's, it's going to decompose it, but it's not going to draw nitrogen at that soil interface. It will not transmit pathogens from surface application. There is microbial activity as part of that decomposition process. So, you know, it's, it's just not going to do it. And I've heard this before. If I have a mulch pile that's going to harbor termites or rodents, the texture itself, uh, through um, talking with other colleagues as well as uh, a paper that I, I have a reference for, um, that information just does not hold water, does not hold weight. Um, we hope that the mulch doesn't hold water. <laughs> but anyway, the texture just does not lend itself to tunneling or nest building by these rodents or these insects. It's not a perverted, perverted environment, um, and it's not an appropriate food for termites. All right, folks, we're almost at the end of this program. I uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I've heard this uh, a number of times from clients that will call up, so I'm uh, asking you, uh, kind viewers, to help dispel some of this information, these myths. Mixing sand and clay soil helps drainage. Take a look at the structure of clay soil. Clay soil has no aggregate structure. Adding sand to that environment, it would take a lot of sand. It would take 50% of total soil volume to significantly make a change in that native soil texture. If you have a high clay content in the soils that you live around, which we do in, in our county, um, it is productive. It, you just got to cut loose that, <laughs> cut loose some of those nutrients in that that's being tightly bound to that cl those clay particles. Uh, but it would take so much that it's just impractical to um, to amend the soil in that fashion. So my advice is slow and steady. You can slowly change the um, texture of that soil, the nutrients that are present by applying organic matter over time. We do this through mulches. We do this through, you know, through moderate uh, compost, incorporating compost into the environment, whether it's vegetables or ornamental landscapes. So think of that, slow and steady is the course. And finally, this has been a pet peeve, but always fun, uh, fun to address. I've heard this uh, quite a number of times, always place gravel in the bottom of my container plants. This is one of the pictures that I've taken. A lot, all of the pictures I've tried to uh, 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 provide an attribution to where the pictures came from in this slideshow, but I'm proud to say I'm starting to build slowly, build my own uh, photo collection. And this is a couple of plants, indoor uh, container plants that I have at home. The one on the left-hand side, you can see it's totally enclosed, which has its challenges. I have a lot of challenges trying to figure out when that when I need to water that plant to keep that prayer plant alive, happy, and growing. And then the one on the right hand side has a removable um, a removable tray. It's a little bit easier to keep track of water on that one. 
But I have heard this from folks. I always place gravel in the bottom of the containers. The thought behind that is it helps to wick water away from the water that you've applied to the soil so that you won't overwater your plants. Well, there's, a, there, there's already an obvious challenge. If you've got a, a container like the one I'm showing you on the left-hand side that has, um, has no means for removing water if you've applied too much to it, that can be a challenge in, in itself to try to figure out if you've overwatered or underwatered. Uh, the one on the right hand side, you have a better ability to keep an eye on the water uh, that collects in the bottom of the tray. Um, but still, does gravel actually provide that service? Let's look at the, at the um, soil itself. Remember, soil does hold water and you need to saturate that soil to, to get it to release and we, uh, to release from that soil environment down into a completely different texture of you know this um these uh, rocks that we put below it this mineral these um gravel or rocks that you put below that soil so at that interface the water is first off the water is not going to not it doesn't just flow through as you might think it would sometimes the soil itself is is developed or media is developed to capture and hold water right so and it's not going to be released unless there's some sort of a force like gravity that's going to help push it through. You've also got an interface, right, of two different textures going on. That in itself can uh, be a barrier to water actually making it through to the gravel that we're thinking is going to be that tray at, at the bottom of that container. The only solution for that is using a uniform, well-draining media or soil inside of the container itself. It's as simple as that. You're going to be tempted to put a, 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 a larger rock or a pebble in that drain hole. I encourage you not to do that. I also encourage you not to put um, not to put a, a, a layer of gravel on the bottom. Just use a well, a uniform well draining media in that container. It will resolve those kind of issues that you may experience. Well, folks, um, these are some websites that I'd like to point you to and explore. Of course, always best information from Aggie Horticulture, aggie-horticulture.tamu.edu, and, and uh, also investigate the wonderful programs that we have to offer to our public. Earthkind Landscaping is embedded and has access to that within Aggie Horticulture. I um, had the uh, benefit of going to the University of Washington and had great exposure to some uh, really outstanding professors while I was there. One professor uh, that I um, that was a, a partial mentor for me um, does participate with colleagues uh, using critical thinking to dispel some myths that we may have heard. So I direct your attention to a website called the Garden Professors, uh, gardenprofessors.com, or their website, uh, their uh, Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash the Garden Professors. Um, there, uh, the professor that I was talking about, uh, Dr. Linda Chalker Scott, uh, she uh, works for Washington State University Extension, uh, a professor, uh, and uh, she has a web page devoted to horticulture myths. I encourage you to go visit that. Uh, you'll see a number of articles that she has gone through that work, going through peer-reviewed journals and articles to elicit some of that information and break, break it down and apply critical thinking to it. So she's done the work. Not, I'm not saying be a lazy, uh, be a lazy researcher, but you know that work has been done, and it would help you to explore further, you know, uh, the the truth behind some of this this research that's currently going on. There's another gentleman named Robert Pablis. Uh, he's developed a website called Garden Myths. Um, his writing style is lacking a little bit in my in my uh, in my opinion, but. He has logically thought through some topics and he does have some interesting articles from his website. So I do encourage you to go to his website and explore some of those articles. And then if you're looking for accurate information on native plants, go to the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center's uh, website. They have uh, wonderful, accurate information associated with native plants to Texas as well as around the United States. And of course, your local chapter of the Native Plant Society of Texas. You can also go to Aggie Horticulture. We do have a few websites devoted to 
um, Native Plants as well. The Native Plant Society of Texas, uh, of course, is a um, organization made up of uh, colleagues, but mostly passionate and um, passionate. Um, um, uh, gosh, uh, community members that are interested in native plants and trying and they are uh, trying to find accurate and solid information for you. This is just a website to the South Texas chapter and some resources on native plants appropriate for your area. Um, well, folks, that's that's it for my um, my program today. Uh, Skip, are there uh, any questions? I'm certainly open for them. Yes, we have a we have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, I, I was uh, surprised to see in the chat we have some folks from uh, Community Garden out in California that are watching these things. So they they and some others have said thank you, and and uh, um, several have expressed appreciation for your program today. Uh, there there was some discussion about using sand to level your yard. Uh, I know it's a little outside the topics, but uh, somewhat related. Uh, do you recommend putting sand out to level spots in your yard or do you see that as a problem? I think that was uh, coming from maybe your comments about sand fixes a clay. I, I would say uh, sand is used as a um, used, sand is used to help uh, level out uh, areas of the lawn, but it's applied, gosh, how, how do I put this? So typically when there's, when I have a client that's had, that's, and I have had some clients that have said, you know, I've got some uh, low lying areas in my yard. You can't apply soil, uh, you can't apply sand to that, um, that environment. Coarse sand, not, uh, not like uh, the play sand that you, you know, that your kids play in is appropriate, but only so much per year. The, the areas that this, uh, that this client was looking to fill in some holes or, or try to level out a little bit, it had some really beautiful uh, larger trees that were in that area. And, and if you apply too much of that uh, in that environment, it can help. It, it reduces the oxygen exchange in the soil. It can be detrimental to those uh, to the plants, to the surrounding environment as well. So you do have to apply it uh, a little bit at a time, unfortunately. I, I can't remember what the ratio is. I think it was a quarter of an inch, a half an inch, no more. Uh, than that, uh, so it's going to be a slower process. I, I think Michael is commenting on it in chat. Michael Potter is a horticulturist over in uh, Montgomery County, Conroe. Uh, so he may, Michael, you may want to add to that comment a little bit. Uh, yeah. The when amount it, of time. Yeah, when it comes to to lawns, I sand is is really more used in the golf course arena as far as home lawns are concerned, especially when it deals with St. Augustine. Um, you know, if you've got low spots which you've been, you know, you've been getting, uh, you know, soggy and you get large patch in those areas and things like that, you may want to go with something more like a sandy loam. It still has the sand in it and it'll still allow for water percolation or, or water to, you know, to translocate through that soil, um, but it'll provide, you know, the stability as well because um, your sand is just going to eventually get squished and go down into the clay and it's going to basically disappear as it gets wet. So a sandy loam would be a little bit better, and it's about half an inch uh, is what you would have to apply at one, that you can only apply at one time before smothering it. Now, if you have areas that are, you know, three and four and five inches deep as far as a sag in your lawn, then I, you know, you'll just have to get used to the fact that you can fill those areas in and then just maybe put sod over the top of it to have it fill in quicker. All right, thanks. I, I uh, Stephen, I have some more questions, but I just want to make a comment. We had a little bit of a discussion about uh, styrofoam peanuts in the bottom of a pot, and you had very well explained why we don't put coarse, chunky material in the bottom of a container. Uh, there, there is an exception, and Ginger pointed this out, uh, that if you had a really large container, one time I planted in a couple of very tall terracotta uh, they're used to line a chimney, the, you know, like three feet high. Well, I did not want to buy three feet of potting soil for some little flowers to go in the top. So I used uh, soda pop bottles, a little water bottles rather, uh, and with caps on them at the bottom to lift the floor and then put a, a screen and cloth across the bottom 
so that the potting soil wouldn't fall all down in there and created what I would consider an adequate depth. Uh, but that wasn't to improve drainage. It was just to save on a lot of extra potting soil that in that case wasn't needed for those plants. But uh, that doesn't change the principles of what you were talking about and, and the fact that it's absolutely true. I had a question come in. You'll love this one. Um, <laughs> in the book, uh, in an organic gardening book, uh, they said that cedar flakes and citrus pulp will completely control nematodes. Do we have any research on that? Ah, uh, citrus flakes and oh, I, I, that's a new one to me. Uh, I'd have to look into that. Any of our other horticulturists on the on the call today have comments on that one? Citrus flakes. What else was it? Uh, cit cit uh, cedar flakes and citrus pulp. Cedar flakes and citrus pulp. I'm writing it down so I can so I can do a little bit further research, but I'm. Uh, yeah, I, our I, colleagues. I, yeah, I've not seen research myself on that, uh, and I. Number one, I doubt it. Number two, uh, if you have a sizable garden, um, that's a lot of citrus pulp. So, <laughs> yeah, it sure is. Uh, cedar flakes as well. Uh, it sounds like, um, gosh, the uh, it's just such a big world underground. It's it's going to be difficult to apply enough resources to be able to control those populations. Okay. Well. All right. Ginger had put something about that in the comments. By the way, I have uh, po posted once and I'll, I'll post it again, the link if you wanna go watch past programs or if you wanna share what Stephen talked about today with your friends, this video is not up yet, but it very soon will be on the YouTube channel that I just posted in chat and you're welcome uh, to do that. I, one more request, if there are any questions out there, feel free to uh, type it in. And one of our Stephen or one of the horticulturists will be glad to answer. I want to remind you guys that we we are taking the break now until January 6th uh, and uh, then we'll start an every two week schedule next year as we continue these along. And we're even kind of kicking around the idea for some alternative options for this this uh, educational format that we're using. So we're certainly welcome to suggestions, to any any thoughts or ideas, topics you might be interested in uh, hearing about, uh, or format type suggestions as well. Uh, this is COVID forced us into this kind of arrangement, but we're seeing a lot of benefits to it. So I guess we're making lemonade out of lemons, right, Stephen? That's right. <laughs> All right, well, it looks like we're done on the questions. Thank you oh. so much, uh, excellent as usual. And um, now when people gather for the holidays and somebody announces some gardening myth, everyone who's heard you can politely correct that. Politely correct, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, folks, y'all have a y'all have a, a wonderful holiday. Uh, Skip, thank you very much. Mike uh, Potter, Kevin, um, Ginger, thank you uh, for all your support, and uh, we'll see you next year. Great job.